And like your family, like a Nigerian family, like yes. were you born in Canada or were you born uh, in Nigeria? No, I was born born in Nigeria. I came here when I was four. So the first few years uh, when I came here was living in uh, in, in Jane and Finch. Mm -hmm. Mr. Dreammaker himself. I shifted over to real estate and then the rest is history. A man managing over $100 million in assets. It took me 20 years to get to where I am, but it doesn't have to take each of you 20 years because we've built an institution now. So instantly, we went from 10 founders a year to over a thousand black-led founders that have gone through our program. Wow. We met Eldon Holder, yes, right? So, yes, yes, and yes, he yeah. spoke proudly of being part of your team yes. and just like being one of your right-hand guys of like, would you say that that specific group of people, if you did not have that, you would not be where you're at today? As the building was going up, starting to see the impact it was having. And this is like the biggest wealth transfer ever in tech. Hello again. Hello and welcome to Hustle Over Everything podcast. This is a podcast where we receive stories, tips, and tactics to entrepreneurs who have done it. Today we have a treat. The man who's making dreams happen. Mr. Dream Maker himself. Yes, sir. A man managing over $100 million in assets. We have Isaac Oluwalafe. Big boss. <laughs> Dream Maker CEO. Yes, sir. Partner in BKR Capital. You know, connecting black talent to tech, to entrepreneurship. We are going to have a good conversation today, just diving deep into his journey and just talking about entrepreneurship from a real perspective, you mm -hmm. know, a casual conversation and being real as men. Mm -hmm. So, Isaac, how are you, bro? Doing good. Doing good. Been a nice, uh, another long day, you know, nice balance yeah. mm -hmm. between family stuff, business stuff, nonprofit stuff, mm -hmm. real estate stuff. Just a regular day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I see you're rocking a fire watch there, man. What is that <laughs> on the wrist? What is that? What yacht, you yacht master. Uh, yeah. Yacht master. Yeah, yes, yes. I'm becoming like really accustomed tone. to watches. And I'm like, when I see a nice watch, because when you walked in, I didn't even notice it until you pulled the suit sleeve back. Yeah, the, the blue And I'm tone. like, wow, that's such a fire. <laughs> so are you a collector yourself or? Yeah, I like watches. You yeah. Know, watches, mm -hmm. that's a... Uh, yeah, I like watches. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that like, says yeah, enough. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, like, I'm a like, seasoned like, guy in watches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right, so what's your favorite watch in your collection? The Yacht Master and then also the rubber band mm -hmm. Rolex. Rubber yeah, band the Rolex. one that, that came out about four years ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. The Prezi, also, I like that one, too. Mm -hmm. But the very first Rolex, yeah, that one, that one uh, it was, uh, was the entry-level one. You know, I remember I was like, just got into real estate. That was a... That was a nice one. Yes, sir. What's yeah, that? Yeah. What's that track? Ever since I got the rollie, I ain't got the time. <laughs> <laughs> Most definitely, man. So there's a few things in your story that I want to touch on that relate to me personally. Mm -hmm. You know, one is Woodbridge. Yes. And two is UPS. Yes. You know, and I'll let that, I'll let the audience know what that means. In <laughs> let a them marinate. You know, so for one, let's talk about Woodbridge, you know, because as, as black men, it's overall, you know, the exposure leads to expansion, yeah. you know? What did that mean for you when, when you were moved to Woodbridge as a youth? It, it was night and day. Like, again, growing up in Martin Grove and Albion and then going to Holy Cross, which was literally about 15 minutes um, apart on the same Martin Grove, but literally on the other side of the of the tracks, as they say, it was uh, big exposure, you know, to, to everything from different culture to the way of life to way of thinking, mm -hmm. mindset. And right off the bat, it changed a lot of my perspective mm -hmm. to shaping me where, where I'm at now. Mm. Most definitely, man. Uh, something that happened to me as well, you know, um, we talked about this on the Puya episode, yep. you know, um, the mindset shift that comes when you change perspective, change environments. You know, um, I was raised in Malvern and then went to a uh, boarding school in Oshawa. Mm. And that completely changed my perspective on life and how I, move as a young man you know and i can only imagine what effect moving from i think it was jane and finch yeah well so jane and finch and then martin grove and albion mm -hmm. and then to uh to highway 7 and martin grove mm -hmm. or or aberdeen mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and like your family like a nigerian family like yes. were you born in canada or were you born uh, in nigeria no, i was born born in nigeria i came here when i was four so the first few years 
uh, when I came here was living in uh, in, in Jane and Finch. Mm-hmm. Uh, went to elementary school in um, in Jane and Finch area, and then went to St. Charles Garden um, for for high school for yeah for elementary school as well too. And then you know, and then Holy Cross for grade nine, mm-hmm. and that was the big uh, the big shift, all because of sports, mm. yeah. soccer, no soccer. Yeah, what position yeah. do you play? Striker, not sorry, striker, sweeper. So I wanted to play striker, but they needed me in the back, right? So Man. I was playing sweeper. Roberto yeah. Carlos. You're telling me the sweeper position is like a lot of like the work rate you must have is extremely high. Oh, for sure. A sweeper is one of the most dependent positions yeah, on yeah. the field. Mm-hmm. You know, I would say next to goalie. Correct. Um, it's like you're the last line of defense, mm-hmm. you know, and sweeper. You're doing a lot of quarterbacking, right? Yeah, yeah. a lot of quarterbacking because yeah. you're like, yeah, you're the last line of defense. So you see everything going on ahead of you. So right. you see people being like, oh, you need to go to this side, you need to go to that side, you know? So it kind of puts you in a line of point guard, quarterbacking. Is it like, like um, a center back? Nah. Yeah, well, it's center defense. Center defense. Center defense, right. yeah, yeah. Gotcha. But, but then what... It's a different way of playing it, right? Because you could be a sweeper on one side too. Right. Yeah. How you play it. Sometimes I'll play right D. Yeah. And then one of my closest boy will play sweeper, and mm-hmm. we will always be. You know, he'll he'll take the mid. I'll be on the right side. Exactly. And yeah. Anybody yeah. that was coming down the the wing knew I was going after the legs. Right. Mm. I was taking them out. Yeah. <laughs> Is it like uh, Stevie G, Stephen Gerrard? Like, would you would you classify him as a sweeper? Stephen Gerrard. Actually, I kind of like Liverpool. Lie to you. I don't not, watch soccer. You know. Do you watch soccer? Not as much. I, oh, I wish I watched it a lot of But that sounds like something like he would be doing. Like he's he's going like end to end. Like end. everything in the back. He's playing defense. He's mm-hmm. tackling. He's yeah, passing. Yeah, yeah. Captaining, calling the plays. I mean, yeah, that's when you say sweeper, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Sweeper is more like the responsibility. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? It's mm-hmm. like you can be on the left side, but hey, if this ball goes in, correct, yeah. <laughs> it's your ass. It's on you. Know? you. It's on you and the goalkeeper. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, all right, so let's move on to, to UPS, man. I think this is an interesting story for for your journey, yeah. you know, when it comes to um, the inception of building what you currently have now, you know. Um, talk to us about the mindset you had working at UPS and how old were you at the time? So I would have been, because I would have just started university, so I think 20, you know, 19, 20. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, 20 when I was at, at UPS. And really the mindset at that time was, you know, sacrifice at all costs and what's the one thing that I could sacrifice that wouldn't impact, you know, the other things that were important, like doing well in school. And that was that was sleep, right? So, mm-hmm. you know, took the midnight shift because I'm like, you know what, I could try and get away with a few hours and get to school and try and make it through classes so I could do it again the next, the next night. So it was uh, 12 to four or five a.m shifts and you know get Damn. back luckily it was right at the border right by york university right at the border near near woodbridge so it wasn't too far a drive back at four or five a.m except when there were snowstorms mm-hmm. then those were interesting drive-bys <laughs> holy that's crazy man so you're working at ups you are making money like what are you working towards at this time because you're in uni and you're like sacrifice sleep just to work a job, right? Where a lot of people, their main priority is to get good grades. What made you decide to, you know what, I'm going to work as much as I can during these crazy semester courses and everything that I got going on right now? Well, the interesting thing was that at the, at, uh, at UPS, one of my boys told me, he's like, yo, did you hear at UPS, they give tuition reimbursement? Mm-hmm. Like, oh, that's amazing because, oh, cool. you know, fortunately, you know, my parents, they've already sacrificed, saved, did different scholarship programs for several years where I didn't have to actually pay tuition. Pay tuition. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, this is a great opportunity where I could be doing a job, getting paid, and then as long as I meet certain marks, I could get tuition reimbursement, put that together, and then start seeing, okay, how do I buy my first crib? How do I buy my first property? Mm-hmm. Right, so that's really the what was the mindset, and really using that to start the business. And were you like an only child? Did you have siblings? Had siblings. First of uh, first child, two brothers, one sister. Mm-hmm. Um, one year younger, five years younger, and then seven years younger. Yeah, mm. those are the top yeah. of uh, yeah. four. <laughs> and yes. the pressure must be tough because in African households, like the eldest is like you're the you have to set the gold standard. Correct. Are you a right? doctor? Correct. Pardon. Are you a doctor? Are you a yeah, doctor? A doctor, a lawyer, engineer. Engineer. Well, computer science was what, you know, because definitely I wasn't going to do med, but 
med school, but computer science was what I went into mm -hmm. university with until I realized, shoot, I got a program, mm -hmm. right? And that wasn't something I was mm -hmm. willing to learn, right? Well, you're like, did you realize, you know what, this ain't for me? <laughs> the first semester, I think the first two court, the first two classes, I'm like, this is not like high school, yeah. like, but uh, yeah, so right away, I'm like, okay, I got to figure out where I could shift into, and that's when I saw economics, management, I'm like, okay, this is... This is interesting. interesting macro macro economics psychology mm -hmm. i feel you i feel you and now <laughs> on the ups thing the reason why i brought that up wasn't just because of the job and the buyback which i didn't know i think that's a big jam though if it's still going on definitely leverage that if you're a student take advantage yeah mm -hmm. um you are using that money um, on purpose Correct. with intention yeah talk about that yeah no again and, and why it's so important because i wasn't the only one sacrificing my sleep Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, there's a there's a large group that was working the midnight shift, um, but everyone had a reason why they were sacrificing sleep. Right. So for me, I was sacrificing my sleep to start getting into the real estate game, to start getting into the entrepreneurship game. Um, and again, and it was the, the easiest way for me to do it that allowed me to do whatever I need to do during the day. That doesn't conflict, conflict with it again. And it wasn't obviously it wasn't easy, but nothing great is easy and i think you know that start you know laying the foundation of okay how do you multitask between working at night going to u of t um studying mm -hmm. start my real estate mm -hmm. courses yeah. as well too to to become a real estate mm -hmm. agent and just doing all that and sort of laying down the roadmap of okay if i get my license who could i start working with where do I start pitching? Mm -hmm. Is it at U? Is it at U of T? Is it at UPS? Mm -hmm. Yeah, amazing. And um, you know, it's interesting. So you go from computer science to deciding to enter, <laughs> going to business. Uh, what influences did you have around you to push you towards that direction? To think about, I could be an entrepreneur. I can get into property management. I can get into real estate. Because uh, it must be some influences at a, such a young age yeah. that spurs you in that direction. Well, absolutely. Again, it was the environment of again being in that in, in that environment of Woodbridge, where a lot of my my friends, parents, um, they would talk about real estate even while we we're in high school. As they were finishing, they're like, you know what, we're going to get together, work in the summer, and try and buy our first property. That's the mm -hmm. conversations you know they were having. And then my dad was already in real estate um, as a real estate broker, so getting that exposure of real estate at home. Mm -hmm. And that real estate from some of the friends that I hang out with, hung out with, um, just always just gave me that interest. And then again, studying the the landscape and seeing the how real estate was having an impact even in Woodbridge, right? Mm -hmm. And and you know who was buying the real estate, the lands they were buying, you know, custom homes that were being built, and it was just something I was intrigued on. Mm. So, how much money did you save up? So the first property that I bought was um, zero down. Only had to pay closing costs. Yeah, so it was zero around down. Zero, zero down. down. What 40, year is this? Forty year amortization. So it was almost twenty years ago. Jeez. Zero down. Forty year amortization. What a blessed time to be alive, with, Isaac. With, with three, with <laughs> I think we paid like thirty five. They paid like thirty five hundred dollars for for closing costs. I remember it was with Scotia Bank. and it was the but the interest rate was about six point nine. So that's mm -hmm. why like oh, okay. Now I don't really look at interest rate. I look at value, mm -hmm. right? I don't really move based on the rate. I move based on the value mm -hmm. and the location um, and, and if it makes sense, Yeah, right? Because I was paying 6.9%, you know, 20 years ago when I was doing zero down for your amortization when there was cheaper rate, but that was what made sense for me to enter the market at that time. Yeah. Right. So you have to do what you got to do. Right. Yeah. yeah. You got to get into the game, got to get into the system, um, no matter what. Right, it's costly to get in when you're starting from scratch, um, and that could be from a, a rate point of view. That may be from not the most um, prime location, but still be able to learn the process of buying the property, dealing with tenants, and and managing that whole aspect. Mm -hmm. Have you done work on that property like uh, over the years? Oh yeah, over the years. Now now we sold it because again, you know, as you know, as we grew. We start to shift the type of real estate and assets we want to focus on. Before is whatever was the cheapest, regardless of the location. Then it shifted to got to be downtown Toronto. Mm -hmm. Then it shifted to stacked townhouses because it's too expensive to buy a regular townhouse or a single dwelling. 
Then it shifted to back to condos because you want to be in the city and you can't buy a stack townhouse in the city or a townhouse because it's just way too expensive. You know, then it shifted to multiplex. Then, you know, then shifted to development. So as, you know, things were shifting and growing, so did our, our appetite. Mm-hmm. You're, so you're speaking about we, 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 right? So you let's go from getting the first property and then to developing that vision of let's start accumulating more assets because there's a little bit of a disconnect there from <laughs> going to, let's go to condos, let's yeah, go to duplex, let's go to townhouses, right? So walk us through that period of, I got my first property. Now let's develop a plan to accumulate a basket of different properties across the GTA. I think the 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 the, the favorable thing is that apart from my dad being in real estate, I was fortunate enough to have some close friends that also saw the vision of buying real estate. Mm-hmm. Um, so we were able to bounce ideas together and figure out, okay, markets together, crunch numbers and figure out, okay, does it make sense to buy a Kipling and Steels? Cause that's all we could buy right now. So it makes sense to buy an, in a Nelson across a Malvern town center, yep, right? Yep. Cause that's what we could afford at that time. And then, you know, um, downtown at front and Spadina fly condos at, you know, 149, 900, crunching the numbers to make it make sense at yeah. 149, 900. Like, like crazy how we were crunching numbers to make 149, 900 make sense um, almost 16, 17 years ago. And then went at Queen West when they were starting at 200,000, right? So it was good to be able to bounce ideas with, with individuals that were close. And because of that, it really just kept on giving me the push, mm-hmm. right? To be able to try and scale and do more. And then I always wanted more of a challenge. So before it was like, okay, let's get one or two units. Then once I got my real estate license, then it's like, okay, a lot of people were asking, oh, what did you just do? I just bought a few units, sold a few units. Oh, I was like, oh, I want one. Oh, my friend want one. So now it's like going to developers and saying, okay, you know what? We don't just want three or four for me and one or two friends. We want 10. Actually, no, we want 50. Actually, we want 100 units. Mm -hmm. Right. And then really piece it out to those that were within our network and those that were within their network. And then before you know it, a lot of people were were getting access to to real estate and locations that some of them never been to, you know, downtown the city, you know, on King West, Queen West. And it was just through navigating the relationships and getting in front of the door and and just saying we want this allocation and this and and distributing it out. So. There's a lot that happens there in that process, you know. When you're working with people that are your friends during that time, what were some of the wins and losses mm-hmm. of working with longtime friends during that process? You know, I think the, the biggest thing is that I always try to tell this with those that are around me that is like, for me, like real estate investment, development, I always use the analogy of, you know, you're going into battles, you're going into war. You know, we're trying to have this goal. And because we're trying to have this goal, there's going to be some wins, some losses. But the most important thing, there's going to be struggle, but there's going to be growth. As long as the struggle and the sacrifice is in the right direction, going back to the UPS days, like I had to miss going out, you know, at nighttime, going to the clubs and this and that, you know, but the sacrifice of not going out to the clubs was for a greater good, mm-hmm. to be honest, right? For the sacrifice of not sleeping eight, nine hours was for the greater good. So when things become discomfort, it doesn't really, you know, move me, right? Because I've put myself in uncomfortable situations by myself. Mm-hmm. Like not being, when, sometimes it's hard to deal with difficulties when you're put in those situations without preparing yourself for it. Mm-hmm. And then sometimes you're on the battlefield and you know you're about to enter a battlefield, but you prepare to and train to be on that battlefield. So, you know, when you see certain things that typically would make somebody else scared or somebody else freeze, for you it's like, okay, this is normal because we're trying to achieve X. And achieving X is not going to be easy journey. So the hardest thing was making sure I had the right group around me that truly believe that and, and and we did and still do yeah i was gonna say that too like i think your group of friends had a major influence on you especially at such a young age because you can be with your boys you're maybe having some shots drinking having a good time but it's very rare to find guys who have a common goal right. and a vision and not just to say hey let's you know it's easy for guys to be 
let's go invest in a property together. Yeah. But to see that plan through and, to, yeah. and to stick at it for <laughs> 10 plus years, yeah. that's remarkable. Would you say that that specific group of people, if you did not have that, you would not be where you're at today? I think definitely like environment overall, whether it's from, you know, my parents moving me to Woodbridge, you know, meeting my girlfriend, now wife at the time that I met, you know, my my good friend from elementary school, reconnecting to with him when I was coming out of UPS and then him also saying, yo, let's get into real estate. And then other individuals that came in and say, oh, I saw what you're doing. And so I think, you know, it's, it's, it was so organic how things were falling into places um, that and it, and it happened so fast because, you know, I was only focused on selling real estate for maybe about six, seven years before I jumped into development. So I didn't really celebrate too many of the sales win, right? Because I was already on to the, okay, I need to put up a condo. Mm -hmm. I need to start putting up some yes. real estate. I need to be part of the supply chain because I'm like, I've seen enough in a, in a six, seven year period. You know, we were, we probably touched, you know, probably close to 50 development sites that we were selling anywhere from five, six units to a hundred units. So I'm like, you know what? I think, I think we figured out this model of pre-construction, buying and holding, packaging and selling, um, negotiating price points, 5% down, 5% commission, assignments, you know, stacks, condos. I think let, let, let's challenge, I want to challenge myself. And that's when, you know, York deal came about. York deal. York deal. What happened in York deal? Built a condo across from Yorkdale. You know, that's it's it's funny again, full circle, you know, in terms of you know, hanging out in Yorkdale when I was, you know, in my 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 teens and in my early in my early twenties to, you know, organically being placed to buy the land across of the mall, you know, around 28, 28 years old, and then getting into a space that again, no really, no, no roadmap, mm -hmm. no mentors. Right. And just being like, you know what? It's 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 either going to work or you're going to get crushed. Mm -hmm. Right. And the amount of people that said you're going to get crushed as I was asking mm -hmm. them, you know, do you want to be part of this and this and that? And the amount of people that, you know, a few people that came and said, this looks good until the first concrete dust that was breathed in. Or until the first brick that was thrown at you. That is like it's not it's not like HGTV mm -hmm. anymore. This is some real <laughs> This is real life. <laughs> this ain't so, Sims. It? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it all looks good on the drawings, right? This it all looks nice. Are. It all looks nice and easy, right? Until until you start excavating and realize there's there's bad soil, right? Yeah. Or or until you're you're doing short casing and and then you know the the wire breaks or or you know you're you're doing concrete work and then there's a strike mm -hmm. right all these different or you know or it's you hate the winter but you're standing outside making sure work's being done mm -hmm. right so these are things that you know you you just got used to being uncomfortable mm -hmm. as you're getting to a goal that you wanted to reach mm -hmm. did you uh, ever deal with any doubts during that process of bringing that condo from nothing into something no, you can't deal with any doubts. Like if you, mm -hmm. if you have one ounce of doubt when you're trying to do something of that scale, everything could crumble. Like, and especially when you know what you're doing is not going to be easy. So you just can't have any doubt. Like the thought of negativity or this can't work, it can't even cross your mind. I don't like being near negative people. I don't like talking about negativity. I don't. I just need to stay positive because I'm already in spaces where it's difficult and hard. So why create more? I create more stress. Stress, exactly. Yeah. Right. Especially when you choose to be in this, right? So yeah, doubt is not is not something even like I when even, the people were like, yeah, Isaac, I don't know if this is possible. It's man. motivation. I love motivation, that. Right. So, eh? I remember sitting in Tim Hortons and people were like, yeah. and I'll just go there with like with a t-shirt and this and that i'm like yeah honestly like we're about to put up this condo and they're like but where's your sales center mm -hmm. you gotta have a sales center are you sure you're the developer like are you trying to 
are you trying to scam trying me? To scam like, me? what's going on? Like, you're, like, how old are you? Like, yeah. like, and and the crazy thing is, it'll be like eight o'clock. I'm here trying to like actually help out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I like get in my car. I'm like, you know what? It is what it is. Man. Like, all you could do is you know help where people want to help, and if not, just keep on keep on moving. But mm-hmm. no one could say that I didn't um, help when I had the opportunity to. Yeah. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching the show. We have some amazing merch live on our website right now. My personal favorite is the Definition Tee. You can go find it in the link below. And if you don't like that, you can explore some other products on our website. If you were to estimate how many no's it took you to get over building the condo near Yorkdale, how much would you say? How many no's and battles? Hundreds. Hundreds. Really? Right, from, from tying up the property to to trying to close to figuring out whether I'm going to be just a developer and bring on a builder to realizing, no, I got to be the developer and the builder. What is the complexity mm-hmm. with that? Like, well, that sounds like you, that, like a big ass hurdle and I don't even understand. <laughs> so, so yeah, break that down. Well, so to, to, to no, I'm, I'm good. Yeah. I'm good too, too. So in, in Ontario, when you're the developer, you get your Tarion vendor license, okay. and that gives you the ability to sell real estate. Okay. And then you're supposed to bring on a builder who will have their own builder, um, Tarion, which gives warranty on the construction that of the property they're going to build. After getting hundreds of no's from lenders, finally got the one yes. After getting a lot of, um, you know, what's a way to put it? A lot of um, roundabouts and yes, we'll build for you. And no, we can't really tell you what the cost we're going to build at and confirm the scheduling and confirm this. And a lot of gray area made me start feeling like, I don't know if I really want to go down this path mm-hmm. without having that level of control. Mm-hmm. Right. So that's when, again, I had to pivot, you know, halfway through and say, you know what, we got to be the developer and the builders will bring on a construction management company that has the expertise in managing a construction alongside with us. But we're the builders on the job. So it went from, OK, let me be the developer. Let me do the sales through the brokerage. Let me do the marketing, um, the sales and marketing and then work with a builder to let me be. The developer, let me do the marketing and sales to let me be a bring be the builder and then bring in um, a management company. So we had to pivot um, right off the bat. I, mean, I was talking with my dad. I'm like, you know, we just have to do it. If we're going to do this, we got to do it all all in. And, you know, I was fortunate again, was able to connect with a few few individuals outside the community, allies that really saw the work that we were doing and really and that's that's what's been great in this journey, connecting with individuals where they saw themselves in me when they started 30 years ago, 40 years ago, where it wasn't nothing, where they had to start from scratch, where they didn't have access to capital, where they didn't have a real network, and they made it happen. Mm-hmm. And that's what they saw me doing, you know, because I'll go there with a package and I say, look, I'm going to save money. We're not going to have a sales center. Let's go to Joey's. And we're going to sell all these units at Joey's. Right, they'll see me at a networking events. I got a picture with me and my and my daughter because at that time she would have been like four or five years, and we'll be at a sort of as a trade show, and she's there, you know, with uh with her golf shirt, and I'm in a golf shirt, and we got the banner that says Dream Residence at Yorkdale, right? And everyone's like, I don't know, we just keep seeing this sign, Dream Residence at Yorkdale on this land. When are you actually gonna break ground, right? So there's a whole <laughs> process of education yeah. right educated while i'm learning right like, so it's like you know getting your phd while you're teaching a course in phd yeah it's like <laughs> yeah. You're, you're learning and building as you go yeah. <laughs> like most definitely and like yeah how like well how much of that was just boost the ground keep going knocking doors asking questions to actual intrinsic knowledge of this is how you set up a property this is how you yeah, so it was, it was a combination ground. of both. It was, again, like when I was selling for other developers, I was always asking a lot of uh, questions. Oh I was gosh. always watching. I was looking at their floor plans. I was looking at the models. Sometimes 
some developers before they launch, they'll give me the drawings and they'll be like, guys, we haven't finalized the floor plate yet, but here's the high level drawings. You know, here's the architecture drawings. We still need to do the engineering drawings um, and, and all that kind of electrical drawings, et cetera. But, you know, play around and see which floors you want, which units you want and what type of bedroom, um, be uh, bedrooms, um, combinations you want. So, I'll look at the floor plans. I'll shape it out. So, okay, I want a one plus den. The den would be an eight by eight. I could put a sliding door after. You know, I want a two plus den, or I want a junior one bedroom that could convert into a one bedroom. So, I was already playing around with floor plates. So, when, you know, Yorkdale was going on, same thing. We worked with the architect and said, okay, let's design it. Let's design it this way. And, you know, let's, let's try and get the best engineer. Let's try and get the best architect and, you know, really just put together, put together a team and, you know, make sure that you're up very early because construction starts very early mm -hmm. in the day. <laughs> yeah, some more sleepless nights. <laughs> exactly, which I was already used to, right? So <laughs> your preparation from preparation, exactly. I guess we gotta give thanks to UPS. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I still have a small little UPS truck on my on my desk. Right? Really? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's 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 it was one of those um, one of those um, pieces within the journey that that played a part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. 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 I was actually, uh, you know, when I said earlier, yo, how you doing, right? And I was like, man, I've been just chopping wood and carrying water. And I was reading this book yesterday called Chop Wood, Carry Water. And essentially, he's talking about people want the success of, let's say, let's say the dream residence at Yorkdale, right? The one that building. But if people were to see that right now, they would not see those hours yeah. you spent at UPS saving money yeah. for your first property. And... People are like, yo, Isaac, come party. Let's go do this. You're mm -hmm. young. You're whatever, right? But chop wood, carry water essentially is that uh, this guy wanted to be a samurai and he went to Japan to learn how to be a samurai. And um, in his first two years, his sensei made him chop wood and carry water. Mm -hmm. He's like, hey, I didn't come here just to chop wood and carry water. I came here to shoot bows and arrows to do this. Right. He's like, well, it's going to take you 10 years. But he doesn't know like that tedious process that those things you got to do that you don't want to just Correct. carry water the same way chop wood grows those muscles so you can actually have that persistence and tenacity when the tough projects come about so it's that whole idea of appreciating the journey and appreciating yeah, no, the journey was things in the present oh yeah because so, they pay off so later important. no they'll pay off and like even you know like throughout the whole york deal period i remember it was easy to to go into the city and mm -hmm. you know sometimes i want to to meet the engineering department or get the sign off from the city. And, you know, they may be in a meeting and just sit in the, the North York city, city center and just waiting for them to come down and just do work in a way. And then they come down, get, you know, documents signed and then bring it to the land registry or bring it to the lawyers or bring it to the consultant, you know, and just being hands on and just getting that whole, you know, that whole understanding of the process. And it was just, I just loved it. I'm like, I want to do another one. And, you know, and 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 they, and as the building was going up, starting to see the impact it was having, right? The impact that it was having with those that said, "Oh, wow, you know, I could be in real estate, I could build, I could renovate, I could do this," right? Because it was just it was in a location that, you know, if you're going down 401, you see you saw the crane and it said "Dream on it." If you're going into Yorkdale and you're going through the ramp, you see the building, you see the hoarding, right? If you're at the mall and you're at Joey's and you look across the street, you see the building erected, right? So it's it's it was it really gave a lot of uh, exposure and gave a sort of a impact and a spotlight to especially to a group that typically didn't you know have that type of spotlight. Like there was people that you know that reached out, came because we had the trailer there, came onto the site when we'll have different um, sessions at that time. And they'll be walking on construction sites and then they'll be, you know, just some of them will be like, they'll be bringing their their kids just to just get that experience, mm -hmm. right? And seeing that, you know, this is a project being done by someone that you could relate with, someone that you could, you know, that may, you know, has a last name that is, that is African, that like it, it, it had that, it had that, you know, ripple effect that, you know, typically wouldn't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you feel like with that specific time, you had that impact that, now you feel like I have to carry this weight of, wow, I'm a trailblazer in the city. I have to continue pushing forward for this thing. Did you realize mm -hmm. it at that time? 
Well, I think, you know, you know, through faith and God, everything always happens for a reason. And I think all the different positions that I've been placed in and opportunities that I've been given that has a ripple effect beyond just myself, I don't think is by accident. And, you know, when you look at some of the other stuff that we've been able to do after the fact, the stuff that we've been doing with the universities, the hospitals, and then now on the tech and venture side, it's, I think, you know, everything happens for a reason. And as, as much as given, as you said, much as ex it's ex expected, right? And, and really it's been rewarding to see, again, most importantly, the impact, to see that I br was brought into an environment and through that environment, it gave me the ability to think beyond what typically would have been thinking about. And then I created an environment that everyone was able to point at and feel like they were part of that environment and allow them to dream. Mm -hmm. Right. So I went from Margrove and Albion to Woodbridge, moved into an environment, you know, living with my parents, the environment that gave me the ability to dream big. I then created environments that by people seeing those environments that we were creating, regardless of them being in it directly or indirectly, gave them the ability to dream big. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's that's a that's the impact that we've been doing. Most definitely. And I, I love the the thought of, you know, impact people to dream big, but I wanna keep it a buck keep it a buck with me. You know? <laughs> when York Dilk went went up, you know, and you had the ability to be like, Yeah, I made that. What was the time you flexed on somebody and it's like <laughs> Yeah, you see that right there? That's me. <laughs> that's me, man. Like, that's me. Well, that's you know what's me. the funny thing is that, like, as a as a father with with three daughters, you know, I don't really flex, but a lot of people around me use that to flex, right? So sometimes I'll be I'll be I'll be in, in, you know in just at events and this and that, and I'll and I'll hear people flexing that they're part of dream. the team, right? Yeah. <laughs> they're, part, they're part of dream, part of the building, this and that. I'm like, oh, that's good. Is someone gonna enjoy the? Mm -hmm. The, the flex at least is someone that's within the within the team but you know it's um you know we 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 allow our our product to do the flex and so that's why i like to talk less unless you know i'm invited to to speak at speak at stuff and just let the work you know, yeah speak even we, we uh we met eldon holder yes right so yes, yes, and yes, he yeah. spoke proudly of being part of your team yes. and just like being one of your right hand guys yes. or like the hotel you built uh, yes. by pearson too like the first hotel, like owned by, you know, a black person in the city. I don't even know. Maybe in Ontario too. Maybe in the country. We maybe in the know. country. We never know. Uh, like the first know. black owned hotel. Like <laughs> yeah, hotel builders aren't really that public. You know, to be yeah, yeah. they're secrets. Me. It's me. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. there might yeah, be some, so but we don't know them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah correct. So, well, walk us through that process, like, building a whole hotel. You know, um, I can only imagine that it could be challenging. Oh, at this point, was it this muscle memory? So I think, again, like I, I don't really, I think everything we do is challenging because we're trying to have impact and we're trying to do something great, mm -hmm. right? So the aspect of it being challenging, that's, that's, a, that's a given. Mm -hmm. But I think it's just, again, learning another thing, mm -hmm. learning something new, mm -hmm. right? And, and why was that? Because we were you know, doing condos, doing Airbnb, the whole wave of everyone getting to short-term rental, Airbnb, and we're like, you know what? Let's do the opposite of what everyone's trying to do. Everyone's running to Airbnb. Let me, I'm not ready to do a 300 room hotel, but let me do something that's boutique and manageable. And that's when we launched a boutique hotel, a two mm -hmm. room hotel, and we leveraged technology to streamline the operations um, of it. But again, the challenge was taking an old industrial building and walking into the building and sort of imagining that if we fully gutted it out, you know, an open staircase could be here, a boardroom could be there, which has nano walls that will open out and fit an event space of 80 people. And we'll cut it right here where behind it we'll have offices that could also, um, rooms that could also be co-working space because it's by the airport. Right, and let's put the kitchen over there because there's a door. So when there's drive-through, people would they don't have to come inside. And then walk upstairs and know that let's keep the stairs in the middle. 
and rooms just going all around so that we don't have to change the configuration of the rooms because there's windows going all around. So every room will have a window mm -hmm. and let's do a four plate that fits perfectly for, you know, um, a studio room. And then let's connect five of them in case there's a larger group. Right. So, mm -hmm. so I think that that was the difficulty of just because we gutted it out right to the bare bones. Um, and then went to the city while gutting it out without any confirmation that it could be a hotel, you know, praying and hoping that they turn it into a hotel. <laughs> the zoning fits. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Oh, so you, so you, no, you, you just had like a prayer. Yeah, yeah. So we, we, had a, we had an idea that it was zoned for night accommodation. Um, but again, there's still specification, um, bylaws, you know, specs that you need to confine with to make sure it works, right? Number of rooms compared to the parking spot, the the height of the rooms, the capacity, right? So all these different, the, the servicing, because this went from a building that only had about five washrooms to now 23, 24 washrooms. So the servicing that we had to connect with the city. So it was a great, it was a great project and you know, allowed us to get our feet wet with our with with one hotel and now it's giving me the the hotel bug where you know hopefully in the next you know six to 12 months we'll be announcing one or two more hotels this podcast is brought to you by nyarai sellers if you didn't know nyarai sellers is the only black owned wine company in canada right now i'm holding the rose the 2021 rose bottle this drink is amazing I mean, it's perfect for those dishes such as seafood where you're cooking shrimp, you're having some pasta, whatever it is you're having, grab a bottle of Nirai Cellars, the rosé. If you're having a date night with your significant other, you know what to grab, grab the Nirai. Whatever it is, grab the Nirai. I mean, you will not go wrong with this wine. It's perfect for everybody. If you've never drank wine, this is a great bottle for you. Or even if you're a wine expert, you're an aficionado and you drink everything. I mean, you cannot go in your eye. I'm telling you, this wine is really, really good. And even though I'm boosting it this hard, it's because I really love drinking it and I'm someone who loves to drink wine. So whatever it is, whatever the special occasion, check on your eye. They have Sauvignon Blancs, they have Rieslings. I'm holding the Rosé right now. They have a wide variety of different collections of different wines you can choose from. Make sure to check them out. The link is gonna be in the description. Check them out, order a crate for yourself, or you can uh, send a gift to someone that you want to gift um, some wine to. Uh, you can't go wrong with that. So in your rye sellers, check them out. Link will be in the description. And I'm back to the show. So, solid. Um, for boutique hotels, what's the business model behind that? Is it more of like a, a volume game or more of like a, a unique markup? on an individual basis. What are some of the business models behind that? Yeah, so for, for we, we call it a multi-unit, uh, multiplex um, building that has a hotel, which is one revenue stream, co-working space, event space, um, kitchen, which we use as a ghost kitchen. Mm -hmm. So that's a different different revenue. We have a business model where you could just book the whole building and have it to yourself. Um, so, and then, then obviously where we do a lot of, um, community events, um, there, um, as well too. Right. So there's probably like 10 different things we're doing with this building. And we just got approved about a few months ago to do another two more floors on the building. Mm -hmm. So we'll go from about 14,000 square feet to about 28,000 square feet freestanding building, um, right by the airport. So we're excited about, you know, what we're going to do with the other two floors because, you know, within that building, we do training uh, for for youth. Uh, we, like I said, we do events, we've done weddings, um, you know, some of these had bachelor parties, you know, during Halloween, someone took the whole building mm -hmm. and had a very interesting party there, you know. Uh, <laughs> very interesting. Very interesting. That's, not, that's all I was saying. Very interesting. Very interesting, very interesting party, like, right? Huh. But, but everyone had a blast. All right, all right. <laughs> everyone had a blast. So it's um, it's a uh, it's a pretty unique building, right? It's a uh, you know, and the whole concept was, you know, and it, we haven't fully flushed out the concept in terms of build, bringing you know the Drake Hotel type vibe to the airport. Right or the Gladstone vibe to the airport, something that's boutique, has rooms, um, has event space, 
has co-working space and eventually, you know, turn it into sort of a membership, mm -hmm. right? So now we're launching sort of Dream Hub. So anybody that's part of any of our programs that our foundation does automatically become members of Dream Hub, which gives them perks, right? So once you go through our training program or our, our entrepreneurship program or our skill traits program, you automatically become a member of Dream Hub which gives you discounts on hotel rooms, discount on event space. Let's say you're an entrepreneur and you want to launch, you want to do a, um, a sort of client appreciation or a holiday party. Now, because you're a member, this facility, you could do it there. You want to utilize an office for you or your staff. You have access to co-working space, right? So now we're, we're flushing that out. We have a couple thousand uh, individuals and entrepreneurs that are going through our program right now and a large percentage will transition into dream hub and then we'll fully launch launch out for for more members mm -hmm. yeah i mean speaking about entrepreneurs you've been heavy into the entrepreneurship space in the city uh starting with you know biff at the dmz walk us through how you integrated yourself in like the tech ecosystem in toronto again it was you know when you, you're always open for, for new things and always open to go outside your comfort zone, mm -hmm. opportunities always present themselves. So, you know, we gave our first gift to U of T for African studies because building institutional relationship was key and mm -hmm. the bigger goal of what we're trying to do and a bigger plan of what we're trying to do. And then the opportunity came to, to do the same thing at Ryerson, now TMU. Um, so the Sheldon and Tracy Learning Center, which is the student learning center um, right at Young and Dundas, um, there was an opportunity to name the third the, the room, the third room, the Isaac Olafe Digital Media Lab, yeah. which again started to you know get us into that digital media space. So this would have been about, you know, give or take maybe seven, eight years ago. So again, you know, put in perspective that the condos coming up at Yorkdale, our first building. Mm -hmm. By that time, we've already secured um, a site in Pickering where we're doing 23 townhouses. And by that time, you know, second child's come in. Um, and then, you know, a lot of nonprofit stuff, speaking stuff. And then this opportunity with, with Ryerson, TMU. And it was like, okay, this better make sense and impact unless I'm not going to waste my time. Because we're trying to put up a building, we're about to start 23 towns, about to have a second child. There's a lot of things that's already taken my time, right? But I was very intrigued and um, impressed with what I saw um, at Ryerson, especially when they gave me a tour and they started talking about what they're trying to do from the tech side. Because at that time, they're about two years in, two to three years in, into the DMZ, mm -hmm. which has grown to be sort of the number one tech incubator in, in Canada out of a university. And I think one year they won in any university globally, right? So through the leadership of the former president, Sheldon Levy, and seeing what he was doing to the university, I'm like, well, you know what? Let's do this play, but it has to have a ripple effect. So let's do this. Let's plant the seed of tech, right? So I planted that seed. And then just one day I was passing by the the room and after i looked into the room beside it and i saw like a tech dragon's den type style pitch. event happening pitch happening mm -hmm. i'm like oh this is interesting so i just walked in so i'm just listening hearing hearing these young entrepreneurs talking about <laughs> their companies and pitching and and why it was just so intriguing is because you know my company when i started i was at university at U of T, and obviously pushing entrepreneurship a U of T at that time wasn't really the reason why you went to U of T. Mm -hmm. Wasn't to push entrepreneurship. Now that's changed. Mm -hmm. uh, now they have different different streams. So seeing that, I was very intrigued by it, and that's when I got interested. Started talking to some some of the founders, and then boom, Dreammaker Ventures was was launched, and then you know, the rest is history. Mm. So is this when you started uh, getting wind of Hopper? Or was it more down the line that you got wind of Hopper and Second Closet? So that was all around the same the same time. I think by that time, Yorkdale was just about to finish 
Jeez, Pickering was wins. was going. And <laughs> I I found the industrial building. I'm like, you know, Airbnb. Let's let's do our own boutique hotel. And then tech opportunities started to come because I was just in that space, right? Building different relationships. And then that's when some of those these tech companies um, um, came in. And then I remember going to a bunch of different tech events, and I'm like, oh, this is interesting. Like, mm -hmm. there's there's not a lot of people from the community at these events. Mm -hmm. I'm like, it's just odd. Okay, yeah, and this me, is like the biggest wealth transfer ever I in like, tech. I know. I was like, and like, and me being like in real estate and construction, I didn't really take notice of the lack of diversity in a whole other industry like tech, right? Because I wasn't in that industry. But because of, you know, the DMZ and being on the board of DMZ and then launching the venture and doing some investment, got inv invited to a bunch of events. And that's when I'm like, this is crazy. But it's an opportunity. Yeah. Right. So in between all the other stuff, I'm like, you know what? Let, let me talk with the university and see if they'll be interested in this sort of idea of leveraging the current infrastructure they have within the DMZ, but creating something just for black tech founders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's when the Black Innovation Fellowship was launched, which is now morphed into the Black Innovation Program. Uh, which is probably the largest black tech incubator in Canada. Well, it was the first out of the university, but probably the largest in Canada. And it just continues to to grow and probably one of the seeds that planted to launch what the federal government and other initiatives that's come after it. Like when you Shopify look at all the, and all the well, 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 Shopify, BMO, and Canadian Women's Foundation were part of the the team in terms of the launch of it because we wanted to make sure that it can't just be us launching it mm -hmm. let's bring on some names that will give it even more exposure gravity and more gravity more impact more expertise because i'm not the tech guy mm -hmm. right so that's when we brought shopify and then we wanted to make sure that is gender as well um uh, equal so that's when we brought the canadian women's foundation and make sure any founders that come at least 50 percent our female um, founders as well too. Um, and then bring an institutional partner with BMO and then boom, with DreamMaker Ventures and then Black Innovation Fellowship was launched. And, you know, it was launched with the idea of impacting 10 founders a year because of COVID and doing online programming and then expanding to Launchpad, um, Bootcamp, and then the Accelerator program, we probably touched over a thousand now. Black entrepreneurs, Black entrepreneurs yeah. right, in a span of four years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we've been we participated in that. Yeah, um, yeah. So when it comes to the, the the program, we know it's it's a it's a ramp program, right, where you start and you start and you scale up throughout the program. Um, what happens when I guess you're looking for investments? Usually, um, is it a process of um, you know, pitching someone like you and then you're like, uh, yes, I want to invest. No, I want to invest. Or is it more so that it's preparing them for pitching other investors and going through that process? Like, how does that work? Could you well, so, yeah, it's a combination of both. So like there was the launch pad, which is really just getting the exposure to tech as an entrepreneur, uh, being an entrepreneur in tech. And then there was the incubator where you've already launched your business and then you want to get incubated so that you're able to rub shoulders with other entrepreneurs see lessons learn talk about stories you know what what are you doing you know how could you help me um different experts come into the space and you're able to learn collaborate ask idea um, ask questions get ideas so that's the incubator and then there's the accelerator for those that are sort of ready to start raising capital mm -hmm. so when the fellowship was started you know we're like okay this is great you know we've now created an environment and an infrastructure for black founders like never before, but there's still something missing, which is access to capital, right? So that's when in 2020, the opportunity came to launch the first institutionally backed venture fund um, called um, BKR Capital, um, which you know worked out very well because of the pipeline um, that we're getting from not only the Black Innovation Program, but also the reach that we have nationally with with other community organization, community partners, and just businesses in general that are now raising their hands because they see there's a fund 
that is being managed and run and founded by an entrepreneur that looks like them. Mm-hmm. Right. So, you know, the whole thing in of, okay, is there enough founders out there that are venture ready? Um, we've seen over 900 plus founders that apply, right? And our fund is $20 million fund. So we could only invest in 18, mm-hmm. but it just shows the demand um, because of the pipe, because of the, the deal flow that's coming through. Mm. And are these founders only restricted towards the GTA Ontario or is it open to the Americans as well? Yeah, so within our within our thesis, we have a 10% allocation outside Canada. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've already invested in a company um, that's digitizing the logistics space in, um, in West Africa. Wow. So they're in Nigeria, Ghana, mm-hmm. Kenya, and Uganda. They're called TRIPS. Shots and now they're Kenya. trying to be the, <clears throat> the Toro of Africa. Um, so they are just launched a digital sharing um, car platform. Um, for for those that have cars that want to be put on a platform to to get used and utilized, um, so they're they're doing very well. We we invested in them two years ago. We did follow on investment with them, so that's the first company we've done sort of outside Canada. We another company called Al- uh, Alternal. Um, they're based in um, in LA. Um, they they created a CRM system for the art gallery space, mm-hmm. um, which is a multi billion dollar space. Um, because of the art space, the value of art has continued to grow drastically. Um, and they've created a CRM system to, to, to make it easy for art galleries to, to manage their art, sell their art, distribute um, their art. And most recently, we invested in a company called Protexa um, in the cybersecurity space. Mm-hmm. Um, that's another exciting one because with, the, with leading the round for that, um, the founder, Claudette, um, ended up raising over $4 million um, and probably now has raised the most from a black female founder um, in Canada and in a space that is growing, like cybersecurity, very important. So Huge. we're excited about that company. There's a lot of great companies we're excited about um, MIQ, which is now called Woven, mm-hmm. right? Or Wovio, sorry. You know, they were based out of um, um, out east in uh, Nova Scotia. Um, we got introduced to them by one of our community partners, did an investment with them, gave them exposure to a Toronto VC, mm-hmm. and then Toronto VC did a follow-on investment at a higher valuation. So that's the impact, mm. again, of what, we're, of what we're doing. It's not just providing institutional capital in a space that didn't have it, um, but we're also providing exposure to founders into a space that lacks the exposure. Mm. What's been your biggest um, win in the investment space? Um, probably be Hopper when they go public. Um, but you're just seeing the dollar signs, eh? Like <laughs> no, but no, so, no, but I think again, there's biggest win and biggest impact. It's you know, it's mm. um, yeah, big difference. I, I still think York deal is the biggest impact slash win thus far. But there's been many others, right, mm-hmm. in terms of, but I just, you know, that being the first, you know, and that being a massive leap, mm-hmm. like it's not a massive leap for me to jump into the venture space. It's more so about having exposure and access, mm-hmm. right, which, you know, with, with dedication and sacrifice, you get that. But to put up a building at the location we did took a little bit more than just getting access Getting exposure. Getting exposure. Because it wasn't just a three-month project, a one-year project. It wasn't just the construction period. It's the planning period. Mm-hmm. It's probably the 20 moving parts, the, um, the hundreds of employees d- directly or indirectly, all the different companies that are part of the project three winters you know two strikes right a tight corner not even an acre right and to fit a condo right at the edge of the ramp and then townhouses at the back at the time where i got more nose then than i do now I still get nose but you know a lot more nose then so the battle to overcome was was much bigger right so so that that's one that i always 
That's a champion. Yeah, yeah. that that it, it it's 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 easy to speak about because it's so visible. Mm-hmm. But then when you go to areas like Kleinberg, you know, you see custom homes that were building ten thousand square feet homes in locations that you typically again wouldn't be seeing someone building from our from our community there. So that's been very rewarding um, as well too. Or going to you know university and mm-hmm. seeing our name on the wall and seeing a program that's been created or now the research and resource center that we're doing with the knowledge hub with Carleton and multiple universities across Canada to shape policies around black entrepreneurship across Canada. Right. So there's, so there's a lot of different plays that we're doing that are, that are coming with wins and coming with impact or the home ownership bridge program that we launched in partnership with black North and with Habitat, first ever of its kind, and CMHC, to provide housing for 200 black families mm-hmm. um, in, in Canada, right? So it's, um, we don't do anything that doesn't have uh, an impact. Yeah. yeah. It sounds like the Yorkdale building gave you this crazy confidence moving <laughs> forward, you know, because yeah. you, three years, you know, boost the ground, lots of no's, managing a lot of people, and to see it come to fruition, I can imagine the confidence you have walking. <laughs> like, if I did that, <laughs> I can do anything. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I'm saying, Isaac? Like, that is yeah. huge. No, I, I think, honestly, the confidence is the faith, right? Like, the faith that if you believe in something that you can't see mm. or touch, but you have faith in God that if you if that idea is in your mind in your heart it's possible right so it's done already it's like, done it's already done so mind. now it's, it's just a timing thing is now is it is it gonna are you gonna give up are you gonna have doubt when it's not done as fast as you want it to be done mm-hmm. like i was pretty excited to launch my first hotel and then COVID hit mm-hmm. right like like literally we had a great event December of 2019. You know, we brought in DJ Envy from the Breakfast Club, came down to the city. Cardi was there. Um, and we did a nice talk on real estate, on business in the city, you know, which you see a lot of that happening now in terms of conversations around real estate and entrepreneurship mm-hmm. with sports and entertainment. We did that in 2019. And that was going to be a continuing, uh, th- something that we were continuing doing. And then COVID hit. But then you got to understand when to pivot, how to manage situations. And it only made us stronger because coming out of COVID, we were like, okay, boom, 18-room hotel, still got it. Still understand. Now let's re-kick it, boom, relaunch it. How can we get a bigger hotel? Not, oh, man, we got punched so many times during COVID. We're out of this. Right, because we knew it wasn't going to be easy, mm-hmm. right? Because we're not trying to build it two, three, four hours away from the city, too. Right, we actually want to build it in one of the biggest and most expensive city in North America. Right, and and so if you make if we if we could do it in Toronto, we go to any city mm-hmm. and do it. So that's why for me it's been important to develop and build in the city, which has the largest population of our community Mm -hmm. and which is one of the top cities is very important to do it in front of a airport, which is one of the largest airports in North America, in the world too, in the world, international airport across of Yorkdale mall, one of the largest luxury malls in North America. um, And one of the largest in Canada or the largest in Canada. And yeah, so like for for us, like and that's all in the city, and you know, TMU right is in the city, mm-hmm. right? So it's right at Young and Dundas. Right, the, our room is actually a nice corner corner room there, mm-hmm. right? Because again, which great exposure, right? So that's generational impact, mm-hmm. most definitely. Speaking of of the city, what's your opinion on? You know, the separation between Brampton and Saga, you know, that's like very um, polarizing right now. Yeah, that's that's going to be interesting to see 
who is going to position themselves, which community is going to position themselves, which businesses are going to position themselves to, to, to benefit from the opportunities that comes from the autonomy of one city and the other. Like, there's so much happening in Mississauga. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot happening in Brampton, right? In terms of investments that's happening in Brampton, you know, both mayors, both on the Mississauga side and on the Brampton side, they're champion, um, their their city, you know, you know, Patrick Brown, Mayor Brown, he's pushing a lot around international foreign investors coming in, you know, has actively gone to Africa, you know, to Nigeria, um, you know, but they're bringing in different businesses, you know, TMU moved there. Really, team in Brampton? Yeah, they, not moved, but they set up a yeah, location in okay. in Brampton. Like, another, gosh. another, another uh, location in Brampton. Um, their the med school is going to Brampton for a TMU. Um, they've launched a cybersecurity space in in Brampton. So there's a lot of, and then there's a lot of land, which is going to equal a lot of developments, right? But then in Mississauga, same thing on the on the Lakeshore side, massive redevelopments happening there. Um, we have a site in Mississauga and Mineola, um, 18 luxury townhouses. So we're we're excited about launching that hopefully in the fall of this year and starting construction in the spring, in the spring of next year. So no, it, it's it's going to be a lot of great. Um, we're looking at some stuff in Brampton right now, um, even in Caledon. So it would be be interesting to see how things plays out once that happens. You, your dream maker and a deal maker. Has there been a deal that you've passed on that ended up doing so well that you felt that, damn, like, how did I not see that at the time? No, I think because I see deals and opportunities, like literally there's a deal that comes every, what is, what's this uh, analogy? Like a bus deal comes every every second, like a bus. Like a comes, TTC. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. miss one bus. Yeah, yeah no, there's coming, coming, yeah. So yeah. like, like, there's actually a science to saying no to deals and opportunity um, and doubling down with, with plays because we have a lot of plays, but the infrastructure that we're building and the institution that we're building, we're, we're spending a lot of time in building that infrastructure because once it's built, then it's easy to plug and play, mm -hmm. right? Like once the university is built, it's easy to have thousands of students getting degrees every year, mm -hmm. right? Right. So that's why we're trying to build an infrastructure where it's then easy to just get thousands of people coming in and out of it. You know, a thousand people becoming members, a thousand people covering Dream Hub, connected to Dream Insurance, right? Then which percent of them are in the venture are are launching a tech company? You know, mm -hmm. which one of them wants to become into the skill trades? You know, now we're creating capacity for when we want to go and do big construction jobs, right? So, and then which one are going to be, you know, ready to to export their work, mm -hmm. their services across across the globe, right? So it's um, I can't remember the question you even asked, but uh, <laughs> yeah, have you ever felt like you lied, like the deal you yeah you no, passed no, up yeah, on no, that because there's so many deals it. every we're we're turning down deals we're putting away like because because like it's it's we're We've taken the risk to be first in a lot of interesting spaces mm -hmm. and industries that we have exposure to so many deals and so many opportunities um, that um, the issue is not about missing out on a deal. Um, the issue is really about making sure that we're focused on the deals that we do have and make sure they're executed at a top at a top standard, right? Because mm -hmm. we're not doing plays that aren't noticeable. We're not doing plays where you may not see it. We're doing plays right in the open. We're working with partners right in the open. Mm -hmm. So when we slip, it's right in the open. Yeah. When we win, it's right in the open. But we, we chose that way. Right, and we we, and as a result of that, we know that there's benefits, and there's also negative, by being so exposed, right? Because you can't make a mistake. You gotta like you, you just you gotta always be on your A game, 
you know, when we're building homes in a top subdivision like Woodbridge and Kleinberg in King City, you can't slip. When you're putting up condos and hotels and areas like the airport, you're, you can't slip. When you're doing institutional relationships with universities that thousands of people go to, you can't slip, right? Could take it. We, we didn't take the easy route of just doing something in the corner because, again, we wanted to have impact and show the world that we could do even bigger stuff. Like we haven't even scratched the surface. Mm-hmm. Like to us, this is we're just you know just getting ready, so that we're given bigger opportunities. So that's why we're showing what we could do in real estate. We're showing what we could do. We're managing a venture fund. We're showing what we could do. We're building a hotel, all in the last ten years. Mm-hmm. And you're and you're pretty young, so there's a lot of upside left. You know. Yeah. God it's willing. Yes. <laughs> good health. Good. You know everything yes. in your favor. Yeah. Yes. Um. So. As we was wrapping up, man, one thing you said earlier that I want to touch on is um, you gave a shout out to your wife, you know, your girlfriend at the time, now wife, you know, what impact has she had throughout this journey on um, keeping you sane? And uh, yeah, I should let you speak on that. What impact has she had on you? Yeah, no, it's really just a, really the focus um, and, and having my back. And now she manages and runs the hotel. Oh. She she helps and runs the 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 foundation and, and helping to build even structure because, you know, for me, you know, 21, 22, got into real estate, 24, 25, launched a brokerage, 28, launched a development company, 29, the building is going up. I then saw the Ryerson play, then saw the Pickering play, then launched Dreammaker Ventures, then 31, 32, launched a hotel, right? And then by that time, had three kids, Right, you can't do all that if you don't have a, a solid partner, right? That that's able to to not. And then the, the the great thing about it is that you know you know my daughters, you know you know they're smart girls, doing well in school, sports, you know, big dreamers as well too, and hardworking and seeing the value of putting in work, you know, and and trying to be excellent. And everything, but understanding that, you know, it's, you can't be perfect, right? But you could always strive for perfection, Mm -hmm. right? And with that takes dedication and sacrifice, right? And, you know, and that's really my wife, you know, instilling that um, in them. And yeah, no, like, again, there's a lot of structure that, that she brought when the hotel was ready to relaunch, right? So that I could focus on the custom homes we were we pivoted and started to do because custom homes became so popular and we went from just testing out one to now having 10 on the go, right? So while we're doing that, you know, the hotel, you know, had to be managed well or the foundation where there was only there for us to do gifts and donation to universities to be in funding to, to run programs where we have to run programs for over 1,500 entrepreneurs and youth overnight right go from one or two staff to 15 staffs mm-hmm. right and growing right so it's um and and that's what she's been helping to to manage and lead to be mm-hmm. honest wow. wow that's insane uh when it's all said and done how do you want to be remembered you know i, I think that we open up doors in spaces where we weren't in and we left the door open once we walked in and we then broke down the door just in case it'd be closed. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we went and opened up more doors once it got full. And then you built your own doors too. <laughs> a lot of doors. Yeah, a lot yeah, of yeah. doors. We, we, yes, sir. We built, we built a lot of doors. Yeah. And I think that's what we, we helped changed policies. We helped change the Canadian space from an economic point of view for the black community. Right, in, in housing, in tech, in entrepreneurship, and in the type of research that institutions do. And in the type of programs institutions do. Not just doing a program in February that impacts us, but doing a program that impacts the day-to-day of the institution. Just like Sick Kids now has the Sickle Cell Fellowship that we started, and then off of that, they've now launched the Black Experience for patients that use sick kids, mm-hmm. 
right? Like that. So that's not now let's do an event on a, in February. That's let's change the way we operate when dealing with the black community, mm -hmm. right? That's our legacy. Well said. With that being said, the hustle is what you can control. So control your grind and control your life. I'm Alex. And I'm Oino Sinde. And I'm Isaac Olafe. That's for sure, y'all. <laughs> Peace. Thank you so much for checking out this episode. Make sure you visit hustleovereverything.co and cop some fire merch that we have in the store. And I'll see you in the next episode. <laughs>